When you think organized crime in Denver, you think small dogs. You know, they were well liked in North Denver. It was hard to develop an informant on them. My dad knew what they did was wrong. They knew bootlegging was wrong, but that's what they did. That, that was their job. That's what they learned how to do. They also helped with the poor. They helped with orphanages. They gave money anonymously to people. So the community, on the one hand, really valued what they brought, but also, I think, feared it in some ways. It's become part of the lore of Denver now. We tend to glamorize and we want to downplay some of the uh, hijinks, uh, some of the, the criminal activity that does go on. In time, they committed crimes to cover up their earlier crimes, such as jury tampering. And this led them farther and farther uh, down this criminal road. Colorado Experience is made in partnership with History Colorado. Inspiring generations to find wonder and meaning in our past and to engage in creating a better Colorado. HistoryColorado.org With funding provided by the University of Denver, celebrating 150 years. The Denver Public Library. The Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. Small Bones were the most prominent crime family in Denver between the 1930s and the 1980s. The Small Dones were not much different than any other organized crime figures in, in throughout American history or, or local histories. Um, America's always been fascinated with the Robin Hood mentality, you know, whether it was Jesse James, who was an alleged philanthropist, although he had shot people. Uh, we always have this fascination, we want to look for the good side of everyone. So you have the Small Dones on a local level were family people, um, they enjoyed their grandkids just as much as anyone else, their family get-togethers, yet they ran an organized crime ring. They ran gambling for, you know, years and years here and were a huge force in North Denver. Um, they built schools and helped out the churches and helped people on the street um, and, and made a lot of money. Clyde was, uh, was the head guy. Um, Checkers was more the muscle. Well, Checkers was his brother and my dad. They were the main two, and they had a lot of other guys that worked for him. Particularly Clyde was an interesting character. Um, he was the brightest of the brothers, and he was the guy who actually ran the operation. I'm Clyde Smalldown. I was born August the 27th. 1906, in a terrace of 35th and Mariposa. Ralph and Mammy Smaldone, uh, these Italian immigrants, raised a large family in North Denver. They ultimately had nine children, including Chauncey, Eugene, and Clyde. Ralph Smaldone came with his parents from Potenza, Italy, and they settled in Denver in the 1890s. Italians came to Colorado really beginning in the 1850s, and that has to do with the gold rush, the Colorado gold rush. And they're coming um, for a variety of reasons, but in the beginning, Italians are coming to Colorado from the north of Italy. And they're coming for opportunity, they're coming because they can travel more, some are coming because of political unrest in Italy. Primarily, uh, Italians coming in the 1850s are not coming as far as labor jobs. They're coming with more resources. So they're coming from the north and they are opening businesses. For example, the Garbarino brothers come and they open an oyster saloon. They created small garden plots in the bottoms along the South Platte River and they sold vegetables and fruit uh, on the streets of Denver as peddlers. The heart of Denver's Little Italy is really Navajo Street and a big part of that is the construction of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, which happens in the late 1800s. And after that, once there's enough Italians in the community to support their own parish, then there's more businesses moving in and then slowly it moves out. These enclaves are built to the protection of the immigrants. 
It's where they can speak their language, they can practice their traditions, their social, religious customs. So neighbors know each other, there's a lot of outdoor bread ovens, there's community celebrations, feast day celebrations. Uh, people know each other, they know their neighbors and they look out for one another. Italians bring to Colorado cultural traditions, food, it's art, it's family. And they, they raise these kids very traditional Catholic uh, Italian family and they always stayed close like that. Nine kids all living in this little house in North Denver. The mom and dad slept downstairs and the kids slept upstairs in two rooms, the boys in one room and the girls in another. And we never had no bathroom in the house. We used to wash in the tub. My mother would wash about four of us at a time once a week. And uh, then my dad, well, he worked at the railroad, thirty dollars a month, and he got to be a foreman. And he got forty dollars a month, and that's when he put a toilet in the house and a bathtub and got rid of the outhouse. And then I used to go sell newspapers. They weren't living in great circumstances. I mean, uh, and so they they did what they could to help the family. They sold newspapers downtown. Um, Clyde tells the story about how. One day he and Checkers were downtown selling papers and a woman gave them a $5 bill. So we took it home and I gave it to my mother and she got scared. She closed the front door and the back door. She said, you should steal that? Did you, where, where'd you get that? She didn't want to believe it. I said, what is it, Mama? She said, that's money. I said, no, to, to Jeannie, that lady gave it to Jeannie, what she did, that this lady gave him a $5 bill. Early on, they were sort of in petty crimes. You know, they stole a pair of pants because the door of the store was open. One time, me and Jimmy uh, Marino, we didn't have no clothes, so we'd seen the, uh, the hardware store door open. At nighttime, I guess they forgot to lock. So when we got, I went in and got ourselves a pair of pants apiece. So we both went to Golden for that. So we got out, and we had to behave myself after that. And then I went to Skinner in 1922. And then I went to North and coached co 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 North. He was a prejudiced man. He didn't like Italians. And, cause he, he knew I was a good football player. But he didn't like Italians, so I quit at the 11th grade. The seeds of discrimination for Italians and Italian Americans really starts in that 1890s era. And by the 1920s, it's really in full swing, this idea that um, Italians are really not assimilating fast enough. The Italians were mistrusted and disrespected and were considered perhaps the lowest ethnic group on the, in the social ladder of early Denver. Mother Curvini, herself an Italian, who came out to help these, these poor Italian workers, wrote back home and said that people in Colorado value a mule more than they value an Italian. Prohibition, something else that comes about that's significant as far as really uh, the intense discrimination that starts to happen for Italians in the 20s is that prohibition becomes really the reason or the it's how people can justify that in fact Italians are more prone to criminal activity. Prohibition began in Colorado three years before the rest of the nation. Uh, Colorado went dry on January 1st, 1916. National Pro Prohibition began in 1919. The consumption of alcohol in the United States was considered one of the major social problems of the mid and late 19th century. Reformers decried the evils of alcohol for domestic abuse, for, for workplace injury. We're becoming a modern nation, a lot of things coming out, a lot of progressive ideas. So you had Kerry Nation, for example, traveling around the country, smashing beer kegs with her hatchet and chopping up bars and scaring the crap out of just about anybody that had a saloon. This led to, ultimately, to the passage of the 18th Amendment, an amendment which authorized Congress to make the manufacture, consumption, and possession of alcohol illegal and have criminal penalties. Prohibition made an activity that many people considered part of their unremarkable day-to-day -day life illegal. And so, by definition, it created a class of new criminals. For Italians in Colorado, wine is part of their daily life. And so when really prohibition comes around, it's very hard for them to understand that something that is sacramental, but also daily use uh, becomes illegal. 
product that was no big deal. And now suddenly to possess it or to consume it and certainly to make it made you suspect in the eyes of law enforcement. But it was also very lucrative. And the small dones and others realized that if they could supply this amazing thirst, they were going to do very well. Uh, that was the bootleg days. And Gerald says, I know where they hide there is some of the whiskey there. We can make money off of that card. So we used to watch the bootleggers and they'd, they'd, they'd take the run the bottles from where they'd hide them into the bar to serve the chops. Well, we'd go see them and go get a couple of bottles and sell them. But we didn't have the sense enough to get what we should have got out of it because we didn't know the price of liquor. We, we sold uh, many of those bottles for two dollars and they was, he was getting twenty dollars for one of them bottles for the rich people to drink, you know. Then uh, Dad Gerald, I said, let's go and partner together. Gerald said, nah. I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start bootlegging myself. We moved our office down on 34th and Picas. And we bought whiskey and sold, and we made our own rum and uh, alcohol. We had some good customers, and we made good money. They used to go have places up in the mountains where they'd make it and everything and bring it down. And then they started going and getting a good whiskey. Real liquor was where the money was, so they started going to Canada to get carloads of, of liquor. And then that's where he met somebody and eventually started getting it from Al Capone. They were running through territory controlled by Capone, so they certainly needed to, to get on his good side. And I was paying 66 in Canada, and Al got it for me for 35 a case, and he'd bring it down, put it in the car, and, we'd, and leave it there, and when we'd come, we'd load it and take it out. We'd come to Denver, so we had everything fixed that we wanted to do, and we did, and we did all right. We had a problem with the cops, but we didn't, we worked that problem out all right. Well, we had to decorate the mahogany. Decorating the mahogany was just bribes. They knew that the most sure way to avoid arrest was to make sure that the law enforcement officials were looking the other way. And so they had very cozy relations with law enforcement officials who worked in their neighborhood. It was a very difficult time for an honest policeman because he would be walking around and he would realize that he could barely feed his family, yet he'd see all this money freely being thrown around. It became a pretty good temptation for a lot of officers to step over and, and to turn a blind eye to a number of different issues. Criminals, organized criminals, and Denver politicians created a very tight alliance. What that allowed was sort of an understanding about who was going to be victimized and who wasn't. Clyde had a lot of uh, relationships with prominent politicians. He was very proud that he had met Herbert Hoover when he came to town and he went to the Brown Palace and went up to his room. And then when Roosevelt came to town, when he was running for president in his private car and they, they took liquor on board, he, he was very proud of those connections. Uh, I, I think in part because of his humble upbringing and there suddenly he is mingling with politicians and famous people. Early on, um, the real mafia guys were in Pueblo. Southern Colorado's faction in organized crime was uh, the, the true mafia. And uh, the small domes in Denver were not Sicilian and they were not mafia. The two groups, one in Denver and, and one in Pueblo, uh, were fighting for the, for the liquor business. Um, like everybody else during the Depression, they were short of money. Um, and so it got pretty competitive. So finally, this guy they worked for, Joe Roma, uh, who known as Little Caesar, because he was only about five foot two and weighed about 120 pounds, um, got shot to death. They shot him in his house, and they thought we did it because we left the house about two hours before he got shot. Me and Gene and and Louis Brinzi, and who else was with us that day? Well, anyhow, four of us went out, and, uh, well, they couldn't find, they, they knew that we didn't do it, but somebody shot him. 
We heard rumors later that who did it, but, but that don't really, it don't bother me one way or another. His death elevated them to the head boys in Denver. Clyde was a, a man who looked out for the people in his community, like an old fashioned Italian padrone. He felt it was his obligation to, take, to look after the welfare of people who were less fortunate than he was. Well, in the bootleg days, I was uh, like Al. He felt sorry for the poor and the sick and people on the lines. He fed them in the soup line. Well, my brother and I, we fed all the Italians and the Jewish, the colored, the Polacks, and the Irish. Well, anybody that we heard that needed something, they could come and they'd get money, we'd get them food. Somebody had a bootleg and they all wanted it. So why not put the, some of that money to good? The first time they got in real trouble uh, was when they were running liquor for their dad. In 1933, their parents were arrested, I believe, on a uh, prohibition violation. Actually, they were going to put my grandma and grandpa in jail for bootlegging. And then they made a deal with the police and whoever it was, that, and uh, they went instead. We all, all, all had a plea guilty under, uh, in front of Judge Sims. Me and my brother Gene and my brother Anthony, brother Albert, Brinzi, and that's when I went down to El Reno. And that was a short time, that was like 18 months or something like that. And then when I come back to Denver after that, the bootleg days are over. And it was a hard time to make any money. When Prohibition went out in 33, um, they were out of business. And so um, they, they started looking around for a new business and gambling was the obvious alternative. Uh, and they got into gambling with a guy named Smiling Charlie Stevens. They had a gambling casino. They called it Blakeland. It was a restaurant, gambling casino, and entertainment, kind of like they do in Las Vegas now. Blakeland was a nice place. They had dance girls in there, and they sang and danced up on the screen. And when we they ate steaks and whatever you wanted to eat, and then we had the gambling on the other side where we had crap tables and 21 and all the things that needed to be. And we made a little money, but I don't think it was worth it uh, for what we made when we had to go to the penitentiary. And to Canyon City. They said I was in on the bombing of some guy they bombed. That was the Leo Barnes uh, car bombing. He had a local gambler by the name of uh, Leo Barnes who tried to take over and, and open up a club and start muscling his way in. He thought he could run the operation better. Uh, and that was a, that was a problem. He was a guy that uh, I was uh, trying to move in on the gambling, I guess, on uh, Charlie Stevens, on Blakelin. And uh, we wasn't with Charlie at that time. And uh, this girl seen the guys that put the car, there was four of them, she says, on the stand. She says, one of them was Gene Smaldone. And they asked, well, how about Clyde? Well, the Clyde wasn't there. I don't know nothing about that. And uh, if, uh, they, they found me guilty of conspiracy. He went to Canyon City. When I used to go visit him with my mother, they told me it was a hospital and that he was working there. And I didn't know anything different, you know. Uh, so I think when I got older, I probably realized that it was, he went to prison. He was there, you know, for four or five years. One of the interesting things to me was that, that um, Clyde's wife, Mildred, was essentially a single mom. You know, he was gone to jail for like 17 years of their marriage off and on. I think he, well, I know he did. He always felt bad, I think, when he went to prison that he didn't spend more time with my mother, you know, with his wife. She had a pretty rough time, you know, with him in and out of jail, lawyers, police. And I guess it kind of broke her down later on, you know, that she had some mental problems, some t 
taking care of the, the boys by herself, trying to run things on her own. They got eight years at Canyon City, and they served about not even quite half that. And then their friend, Governor uh, Ralph Carr, uh, paroled them. Ralph Carr was a lawyer. He actually defended my dad at one time on some kind of case and everything. And then they got to be friends. I mean, they were very good friends, you know. When they got out, Clyde came back to Denver and began rubbing, running the bar up on Pecos, uh, up in North Denver. And uh, he, 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 during the war, as he always did, he knew people. And he started getting uh, gas stamps. Uh, and he had great sources for, he had his own sources for liquor, of course, but he was getting food and all of the stuff that he needed, and the bar was hugely successful. Um, and so he kind of took off from there. From that on, then we started a gamble because we started putting out the, the football cards, and then from there we'd open, we opened a few bar booth places, and, and uh, we had some crap places. They were, they were involved in gambling and loan sharking. They, absolutely, they were. Never prostitution, never drugs, never. They, they actually hated it. They were going along with the old, uh, the old traditional organized crime view that if you're gonna be involved in crime, stay with a crime that doesn't incite public wrath. Something that has tacit approval of the public. Prohibition, well, we know that experiment failed. People wanted to drink regardless of the law. Same way with gambling. It wasn't hurting anybody. It was a victimless crime. They were also involved in loan sharking as an adjunct to their bookmaking operations. They made more money loaning money out than they did gambling. At one point when they were running the gambling up in Central City, they didn't do very well. You know, it was, it was okay. Uh, they made money on the slots. but. The whole idea of casino gambling uh, was way off in the future for them. But interestingly, Clyde was a plenty smart business guy. My dad was good with numbers. When he was older, he'd look at a license plate, look like that, and say 42. He'd add all the numbers up. He could do it just like that. In fact, at one point he says, once the state finds out how much money there is in gambling, they're gonna jump in, and he was absolutely right. If they had money for gambling and they claimed it, they would get in, get in trouble. And then if they didn't claim it, they had to be careful because they would get in trouble that way too. So they did most of the stuff in cash. When he would come home, he would always have three piles of money. And one was for gambling, one was for loan, and one was his own money. And he used to keep them separated. And there, there would be quite a bit of money there. It would be into the thousands of dollars. And in 55, when they got in real trouble, um, first for tax evasion, Checkers failed to pay his taxes for some several years in a row. So they brought him up for tax evasion. And they had the trial and it was a hung jury. And then later on, somewhere uh, that they said that they had talked to some of the jurors. They said there was jury tampering. They got caught trying to bribe jurors, and, they, and then they got in big trouble, uh, and that's when they got 10 years. They think they got robbed by the federal government, that they had agreed to plead guilty if they got 12 years to be served, different charges, to be served concurrently. And when the judge handed down his verdict, it was consecutive years. So they got the whole 12 years. <laughs> 
and but they'd already been in jail for a couple of years during the course of the trial, so they got 10. Uh, they served 10. When Clyde got out in 1962, he was no longer a young man. You know, he was in his late 50s by then. And he went to the other guys in the family, the ones who were involved, and said, listen, the feds are now getting into this. By the 1960s and 1970s, there are government policies and even agencies set up to fight organized crime. So what was once a secret kind of protection for each other starts to change. The bookmaking operation then was kind of split up. Uh, Gene, Checker Smaldone, and Clyde had had a little bit of a fallen out. He said, the FBI is keeping track of you guys and you better stop, and they didn't listen. And so he kind of began to back out of it. He could see where this thing was going and that, um, you know, their time was up. We were able to find out who was who, how to attack them, how the bookmaking operation operated, just how everything went down. So we were able to infiltrate and get into that operation and really attack the bookmaking operation. There were 30 murders in a period between the late 19-teens and the early 1930s, and although they were questioned in several of them, the Small Dunn brothers were never implicated or charged in any of them. They did some bad things, and they did a lot of good things. And that was what they did, and you know, that's probably the only thing they knew, really. Small Dunn's had an opportunity, they took it, uh, they rode with it. Um, they picked up the notoriety, even as in the years later when their, their power and their position was waning. But inevitably, it's not much of a lifestyle to spend looking over your shoulder your whole life. I think there's something about organized crime that people find appealing. They became the name of organized crime in Colorado that people wanted to read about. People liked that connection of being close to these mob guys. If they put those guys on page one, it would sell papers. The small domes were our link to the organized crime history of the United States, and I think that's why they're still fascinating. The small domes represent the different avenues by which immigrants were able to get ahead in the United States. And ironically, it translated for the small domes into a form of legitimacy. They were around from the 20s to the 70s. That's 50 years of Denver history, and people who knew them still talk about them in reverential terms. They were small-time mobsters, but they were our mobsters. Mm -hmm.